Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Friday, October 21st, 2022. Steve Bannon, former top advisor to former President Donald Trump, sentenced to four months in prison for contempt of Congress for failure to comply with a subpoena from the House January 6th committee. Prosecutors had wanted six months. Steve Bannon says he's going to appeal and also says that while today is his judgment day, November 8th, Election Day, will be the Biden administration's judgment day. The House January 6th committee leaders formally issuing a subpoena today to former President Donald Trump for documents and appearance in person for a deposition. They write, you were at the center of the first and only effort by any U.S. president to overturn an election and obstruct the peaceful transition of power. President Joe Biden touting the federal budget deficit falling by half in fiscal year 2022 compared to the year before to $1.4 trillion. With the economy and inflation big issues in the midterm elections in just a few weeks. Secretary of State Antony Blinken asked about using so-called quiet diplomacy, as was used during the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, as a model for U.S.-Russia relations now, with Russia threatening to use nuclear weapons in Ukraine. And Supreme Court Justice Elena Kagan talks about what it's like with a record four women on the nine-member Supreme Court. From the Associated Press, Steve Bannon, a longtime ally of former President Donald Trump, was sentenced Friday to serve four months behind bars after defying a subpoena from the House committee investigating the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. The judge allowed Steve Bannon to stay free pending appeal and also imposed a fine of $6,500 as part of the sentence. Steve Bannon was convicted in July of two counts of contempt of Congress, one for refusing to sit for a deposition and the other for refusing to provide documents. The House panel had sought Steve Bannon's testimony over his involvement in then-President Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential election. That reporting from AP. After the sentencing, Steve Bannon and his lawyer speaking with reporters outside the federal courthouse in Washington, D.C. The attorney David Schoen begins. C-SPAN cameras were there. As usual, uh, the judge listened carefully and uh, entered a decision that he thought was appropriate. We certainly fully respect the judge's decision, but uh, we will be filing a notice of appeal, as the judge indicated. Um, Very grateful to the judge for thinking through the issues uh, candidly, and uh, it's an extraordinary move to permit a stay pending appeal. It was the appropriate move. There are, the standard is whether the case raises substantial issues that reasonable jurists could differ over, meaning is there a uh, solid chance for an appeal uh, to be successful? And uh, there certainly is more than that in that, this case. I've said before, and I would uh, confirm it, I believe that the appeal in this case is bulletproof. The issues, the constitutional issues involved in this case are very important, but Mr. Bannon never got to tell uh, the reasons for his actions with respect to the subpoena, never got to tell his story because the government uh, insist- the government insisted from day one on prohibiting any mention, any evidence, or any discussion to go before the jury as to uh, why Mr. Bannon reacted as he did uh, to the subpoena on the advice of counsel. Thank you very much. Look forward to adjudicating the appeal. His silence was in my direction. Hang on. By the way, I want to say one thing. I, I respect uh, the judge. The sentence he came down with today is his decision. I fully respect. I've been totally respectful of this entire process uh, on the legal side. I also want to make one other statement before I talk about a broader topic. More than any person in the Trump administration, I testified before the Mueller Commission for more hours. I testified in front of uh, Chair Schiff in the House Intelligence Committee more than any other person in the Trump administration. I, attest- I testified in front of the Senate Intelligence, I think more than any, all about the issues related uh, to, uh, to Russia Gate, to all of that, okay? The same process every time. I had lawyers that were engaged, they worked through the issues of privilege, and at that time I went and testified. And, I, and, and this thing about uh, I'm above the law is an absolute and total lie. Now, more importantly, more, more importantly, the judge, today was my judgment day by the judge, and he stated in, for the appeal, and we'll have a very vigorous appeals process, I've got a great legal team, and there'll be multiple areas of appeal. But as that sign says right there, can we have the vote sign? On November 8th, 
on November 8th, on November 8th, there's going to have judgment on the illegitimate Biden regime. And quite frankly, and quite frankly, the Nancy Pelosi and the entire committee. And we know which way that's going. Either they've already been turfed out like Liz Cheney, right, or have quit like Kinzinger and other the Democrats, or they're about to be beaten like Luria and others, or they will lose their power and become a minority and Nancy Pelosi and, and uh, Tom's Chairman Thompson, all of it. This is a, this is a, this is democracy. This is democracy. The American people are way in measuring what went on with the Justice Department and how they comported themselves. They're weighing and measuring that right now and they will vote on November 8th. They will hang on. They will vote. Hang on. They will. They will know. They will know. Can I go ahead and finish? Can I? Thanks. They, on November 8th, on November 8th, the American people will raise judgment and we will groom the Biden administration ends on the eighth evening of the 8th of November. And let me be let me some other thing is that the Department of Justice, Merrick Garland, will end up being the first attorney general that's brought up on charges of impeachment, and he will be removed from office. Thank you very much. Steve Bannon, former senior strategist to former President Donald Trump, and attorney Steve Schoen with reporters outside the federal courthouse in Washington, D.C. More from the AP article on the judge's sentence of Steve Bannon to four months in jail. Ahead of the sentencing, prosecutor J.P. Cooney saying, Your Honor, the defendant is not above the law, and that is exactly what makes this case important. It must be made clear to the public, to the citizens, that no one is above the law. He chose to hide behind fabricated claims of executive privilege and advice of counsel to thumb his nose at Congress. And the judge, Carl Nichols, saying it's clear that contempt of Congress is subject to a mandatory minimum sentence of at least one month behind bars. And he said, quote, in my opinion, Mr. Bannon has not taken responsibility for his actions. Others must be deterred from committing similar crimes. And now to the subpoena of former President Trump by the House January 6th Committee for documents and to answer questions in person. The committee chair, Benny Thompson, Democrat from Mississippi, and the Republican vice chair, Liz Cheney of Wyoming, sending a letter to Donald Trump. It reads, as demonstrated in our hearings, we have assembled overwhelming evidence, including from dozens of your former appointees and staff, that you personally orchestrated and oversaw a multi-part effort to overturn the 2020 presidential election and to obstruct the peaceful transition of power, ultimately culminating in a bloody attack on our own capital and on the Congress itself. The White House Press Secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, asked for a comment. Is there any comment from the White House on the fact that the uh, January 6th committee has now issued a subpoena? And I'm not asking you specifically about Trump, but about where we are in the country where a former president is now being subpoenaed to testify before Congress. Look, uh, I'm just going to speak more broadly on this uh, as we do not comment on any uh, ongoing in investigation. Department of Justice is, an independ is, is independent and when it re in regards to uh, any investigation. But the president has spoken to this many times. Uh, it is important to get to the bottom of January 6th. As, as you have heard him say, January 6th is one of the darkest day in our nation. Uh, and it's important for the American people to know uh, exactly what happened. So that it doesn't, so that doesn't happen again. So we don't repeat uh, that very dark day in our nation. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre speaking to reporters on Air Force One. The January 6th committee says that former President Trump must turn over records by November 4th and then appear for a deposition on November 14th. Donald Trump has not said whether he will comply. He did put out a 14-page statement after the committee voted to authorize the subpoena. He criticized the committee's investigation and repeated the lie of a stolen election. Back to the sentencing of Steve Bannon. The Justice Department has indicted one other former Trump administration official for not complying with a subpoena from the House January 6th committee. That's Peter Navarro. His trial will start soon. Two other officials who the House recommended for indictment have not been indicted, Dan Scavino and Mark Meadows. Mark Meadows is a former White House chief of staff and C-SPAN spoke with a former January 6th committee senior technical advisor, Denver Riggleman, 
who says in a new book that documents from Mark Meadows have provided a great deal of useful information for the investigation. Your book deals with uh, Mark Meadows, and I want to read a portion for the audience, but then you can fill in and elaborate on it. The portion sure. is this, saying, We never received a CDR for Mark Meadows, Trump's chief of staff, but the telephone text he turned over to the committee became the Rosetta Stone for the January 6th investigation. They provide a staggering amount of information. There were 2,319 of them incoming and outgoing. Meadows defied many aspects of the committee's subpoenas by claiming executive privilege. He failed to show up for the depositions and battled in court to avoid to provide the CDRs or the full contents of the phones, of his phones. But he must have saved or uploaded his own data to the cloud or another storage device. And then he and his legal team willingly turned over this extraordinary number of messages to committee. And in doing so, Meadows gave us the keys to the kingdom. We called them the crown jewels. In, in your explanation, if you could explain what CDR is, but can you elaborate? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, because I tried to explain that earlier in the book. Those are the call detail records. Uh, those are actually an individual's telephone records and what their true phone looks like and what we could get. So we never got those. And we know that there were other text messages we didn't receive the content of because they were under executive privilege. Uh, but what I talk about in the book, without CDRs, I couldn't even tell if we actually received all the text messages. So that's that's part of it, right? Um, but of what we received, um, it was just pretty amazing. And I don't know, you know, if they didn't know what they were giving us, or they had individuals that were working on their legal team that didn't know what those phone numbers were connected to or who they were connected to. But what we received was actually the evolution, not only of the alternate elector theory, you know, that became you know such a big deal you know, up on up until January 6th, but also the conspiracy theories. Uh, they talked about Italian satellites. Uh, we saw bizarre links from city members about foreign interference or influence that, that that was absolutely untrue, couldn't be true, right? Just not only by common sense, but by sort of facts-based analysis. Uh, and we also saw uh, the, the legislative, executive, and legal strategies happening in real time, all the way down to people on the ground uh, that were texting Mark Meadows about their cyber investigations and people that were briefing these sort of technical buffoonery uh, all the way up to the presidential level. So when I talk about the Rosetta Stone or the Crown Jewels, or you talk about a roadmap, it's just interesting to see that that roadmap also included things like, you know, um, almost this sort of uh, supernatural or this um, the spiritual warfare type of component to some of the texts also. And I think that, again, seeing all that in one bundle really is is a shock, especially when your team is breaking out and identifying which phone numbers belong to who. Do you think that for all the that you and your team did in gathering information that those on the January 6th committee themselves used it in the best po possible manner? Oh, they used it very effectively, especially at the beginning when you're talking about the text messages and then linking it to the actual interviews uh, or the depositions that we're doing and then taking that into the hearings. I think there's a lot more, though. When you're looking at 2,319 and you're looking at hundreds of people that were connected, and then you're trying to look at call detail records or their social media or their history or what they're doing in the open source intelligence world, what they're do doing on the deep, dark, and open web, you're talking about a massive resource need, a massive analytical need, and a massive technical need. So I still think there's a long way to go. Uh, the committee can be completely effective. And still us need to look at how command and control worked on that day and other people that might have been linked. And, you know, I, you can get pretty wonky in this book. This is not some chatty, Kathy, you know, people yelling at each other type of book. This is a book that's down the line that tries to really make process as exciting as, as gossip, right, or fantasy. You know, you got to make facts, you know, just as exciting as fantasy. So when you look at this, we have a long way to go. I think when we, we look at the number of links, we look at other entities like the Council for National Policy, which Jenny Thomas was linked to, that there's text messages in there that still need to be explored. You have to think that we just need a little bit more you know, time and more resources to look at the entire ecosystem of that day and the entire coordinated activity sort of patterns that we saw um, and that the committee pointed out. It's just, um, I always think that second, third, and fourth level is just as important as that primary level. Uh, and that's why, you know, and I was trained to do that by the military and the government for 20 years. So, uh, you know, I have, a, I have a particular set of skills. Denver Riggleman is author of The Breach, the untold story of the investigation into January 6th. He's also a former committee 
senior technical advisor and a former congressman, Republican from Virginia, served one term 2019 through 21. He spoke to C-SPAN on the Washington Journal program this morning. You can find the full video of his appearance, including calls from listeners and viewers at our website, cspan.org. A former White House press secretary to former President Trump, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, is running for Arkansas governor as a Republican. Today, she debated a Democrat, Chris Jones, and Libertarian Ricky Dale Harrington Jr., one of the many campaign 2022 debates, both state and federal, that C-SPAN is covering. Little Rock TV reporter Donna Terrell asking the candidates whether voters should focus on state issues or make this governor's race a choice between the leaders of the two parties nationally and their agendas. I want to talk about national versus state politics. To an extent, national politics have always been a part or had an influence on local politics. But in this election, it seems we may have lost balance. Um, Are we talking too much about Washington, D.C.? Is this a referendum on Donald Trump and Joe Biden? Or is this a race between you candidates with a focus on Arkansas and Arkansans. And Mr. Harrington, I'll start with you. Well, I'd first like to say that is one of the reasons why I decided to run for governor of Arkansas instead of running on a federal level, because of this hyper-partisanship that is going on in Washington. It's becoming very, very volatile. And my focus in that Senate campaign directly translates to right here in the state and helping the people of Arkansas. We've got to find a way to get away from the violence, the anger, and the hatred that is so prevalent in our country. And we need to start treating one another as human beings that have the right to self-determination. So all the stuff that's going on in Washington and all the talking heads on cable news, sometimes we need to tune them out And remember that we have neighbors in this state that happen to believe differently. We need to get back down to these basics of good governance. To Ms. Sanders, you have one minute. First, thank you so much for having us here today. I think that there has to be a balance. You cannot ignore the failures that are coming out of Washington right now. We have out of control crime that is ravaging our cities. We have a crisis taking place at our southern border, allowing drugs to pour into our communities. We have record-breaking inflation that is hurting families across the state. So these failures of the Biden administration certainly cannot be ignored. However, the reason I'm running for governor is because I think the places where we can make the biggest difference and transform our state and impact and empower families is at the state level. Focusing on things like education, making sure that every child in the state of Arkansas has access to a quality education and that we're putting kids on a pathway to prosperity, that we are building a skilled, qualified workforce right here at home so that everyone has opportunity, making sure the communities our kids grow up in are safe. These are the things that I'll focus on and prioritize as governor, and these are the things I've spent the last two years talking about as I've traveled around the state of Arkansas, and that message is clearly resonating as we've seen. Mr. Jones, you you. have one minute. Uh, Thank you to UCA. Thank you to the moderators. Uh, Thank you, Ricky Dale, for being here again. Uh, Sarah, thank you for being here for the first time. Uh, Look, this has always been about Arkansas. Uh, I'm a seventh-generation Arkansan who grew up in Pine Bluff, and from the start, we set out to listen to Arkansans all over this state. We've traveled to all 75 counties and heard from Arkansas, Arkansans. And what they're saying is that they really want us to get back to the bread and butter issues that matter. And that's why our agenda is pretty straightforward. It's about spreading PB&J across the whole state. Now it sounds cool and sounds cute, but the deal is when you think about a bad peanut butter and jelly sandwich, if the peanut butter's clumped and the jelly's clumped, and sometimes you take a bite and all you get is dry bread. Well, Arkansans across this state in places from Mena to Cove to Stamps to Wabaseka are taking bites and getting dry bread. We need preschool broadband and jobs across the entire state. And that's as governor, that's certainly what I would focus on. Donna Terrell of Fox 16 News in Little Rock questioning Ricky Dale Harrington Jr., Libertarian candidate, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, Republican candidate, and Chris Jones, Democratic candidate, Arkansas Governor's Debate hosted by PBS Arkansas Today, part of C-SPAN's campaign 2022 coverage. The Cook Political Report with Amy Walter rates this race as solid Republican.
President Biden today talking about the federal budget in the run up to Election Day. Washington Post writing the Biden administration said Friday the federal deficit fell in half from the year before as Washington girds for new battles over taxes and spending with interest rates rising and Republicans are expected to take back at least one branch of Congress in the midterm elections. The president was at the White House. Today, my administration announced that this year the deficit fell by one point four trillion dollars the largest one-year drop in American history, $1.4 trillion decline in the deficit. Let me repeat that, the largest ever decline in the federal deficit. Let me be clear, this record deficit reduction includes the cost of my student loan plan and everything else we're paying for. The deficit is down $1.4 trillion this year, even after accounting for 30 years of debt relief paid in advance. You know, this uh, this follows last year's drop of $350 billion in the deficit. And because we're making sure the largest corporations pay their their fair share, cracking down on billionaire tax cheats and giving Medicare the power to negotiate lower drug prices in the future, beginning uh, just getting underway, which lowers one of the biggest costs that government and families have to pay will reduce, because of that, the deficit in another $250 billion over the next 10 years. President Biden at the White House, Treasury Department and White House Office of Management and Budget, saying the annual budget deficit fell from $2.8 trillion in fiscal year 2021 to $1.4 trillion in fiscal year 2022. And it would have been even smaller, but the president's student loan forgiveness plan estimated to cost $400 billion over several years, was put on the books in September last month of the fiscal year. More from the Washington Post article, it says the budget deficit decline was driven primarily by the expiration of trillions in pandemic-era emergency spending, and the gap between revenue and spending also shrank in part due to stronger-than-expected tax receipts as a booming U.S. economy and large corporate profits helped bring in additional funds to federal coffers. Near the end of the president's remarks, he told reporters in the room that he knew that they wanted to ask him about the elections and the battle for control of Congress. So he would talk about that without being asked. It's been back and forth with them ahead, us ahead, them ahead, back and forth. And the polls have been all over the place. I think uh, that we're going to see one more shift back to our side in the closing days. And let me tell you why I think that. We're starting to see some of the good news on the economy. Gas prices are down sharply in 46 of the 50 states because of what I've been doing. We're moving in the right direction. There's more to come. State unemployment today, state unemployment, was all-time lows in 11 states, and 17 states have unemployment rates under 3 percent. The new deficit numbers, there's a, a record, a record decrease. It's never happened before. The election is not a referendum. It's a choice. It's a choice. And the Republicans criticize my economic record, but look at what I've inherited and what I've done, and look at what they're offering. They want to double down on the Trump tax cuts for the wealthy, make them permanent because they're going to expire in 2025. They want to send jobs overseas, where big corporations can, in fact, pay lower wages and increase their profits. And these are tax cuts that give most benefits to billionaires and wealthy corporations. And let's get specific. They want to abolish the 15 percent. 15 percent. What a terrible thing to ask a corporation to pay. President Biden at the White House today. This from CBS News. Republican Congressman Jim Banks of Indiana signaled Thursday that the GOP would use the looming debt limit as a negotiation tool with President Biden early next year, should the party win back the majority in the House in November elections. Congressman Banks was interviewed by CBS reporter Robert Costa. Looming next year, the full faith and credit of the United States, a debt limit uh, extension will be on the agenda for for whomever is in uh, the the majority. Should the debt limit talks, whenever they do happen next year, it's a bit of a vague date at this point, should the debt limit marker be an opportunity for negotiations with the White House on issues like spending, or should that debt limit just be put aside because it's too risky to include that in a political discussion? No, I think it has to be. It's a major it's a major leverage point for the House Republican majority to use to control spending. And we've, we've seen the national debt now surpass $31 trillion. It is a 
key driver of inflation. We, we have to use a moment like that to do things that uh, the administration wouldn't, wouldn't otherwise do that Democrats don't support. Like there are enormous risks to that. Spending caps, balanced budgets, bring, cut wasteful uh, discretionary spending. That has to be on the table when it comes to a debt limit vote. And I think re Republicans are, uh, are uniformly in support of using that moment as an opportunity to do something about spending. I covered those fights a decade ago. You're a business-friendly Republican. A lot of business leaders don't like when the debt limits uh, use as a leverage point. Well, I, I hope that the I hope that the Biden administration doesn't take us to that point of threatening a shutdown. I don't I don't know why we can't come together to address spending issues. And the debt the debt limit is a serious time to bring us together, both parties, uh, the, the the White House and the Congress, to find solutions. Congressman Jim Banks, Republican from Indiana, and Robert Costa, CBS News chief election and campaign correspondent, on Thursday at a CBS Paramount government relations discussion. That audio coming from CBS News. More on government spending in the U.S. and around the world from World Bank President David Malpass, who's a former economic advisor to former President Donald Trump, at today's summit hosted by the think tank Committee to Unleash Prosperity. One of the founders of that think tank, Stephen Moore, himself a former advisor to Donald Trump during the presidential campaign, asking David Malpass about the effects of government spending on economic growth. What I'm gleaning from all the things that you said, and maybe, so tell me if this is an oversimplification, that all of this massive government spending and debt is sort of crowding out capital <coughs> investment, and so it's not going to its best, highest usage. Uh, and the kind of investment we need and everything from technology to fruit production, et cetera, is being sort of crowded out. Is that a yeah. fair summary of what you're saying? Yes, and I'll add to that. Fiscal and monetary policy have been overlapping increasingly year by year as the, as the uh, central banks buy longer duration government debt. So that becomes a r really problematic, you know, we have the first time where the central banks are are adjusting or, or, or fully participating in fiscal policy. Another way that they're doing that is they pay interest to, uh, for, the, for their liabilities. You know, they borrow from banks and buy bonds. So you can wonder, wow, that sounds like a carry trade. So the world is in a giant carry trade uh, led by central banks where they borrow short term and put it into long term assets. Uh, and so, a, a challenge within that is, okay, wh how do they pay? I just saw that the U.S. Fed went negative in terms of uh, its uh, profitability last month, October, because the short-term rates that they're paying to banks for their source of money has gone up, and they aren't getting more income from their assets because they are long-term uh, their bonds that they're holding. So that means a negative cash flow month by month. Now, they're, they're big enough to hold. I, I don't see that as an instability in the financial system. I think it's more proof of the overlap of fiscal policy on top of monetary. So when we work in developing countries, we work hard to try to get them not to do that, meaning don't confuse your fiscal and monetary policy. The temptation in countries always is to have the central banks buy the bonds of their government. So that, so you know, for decades and decades, there's been uh, an effort by economists to say, once you do that, you can't figure out when you're doing fiscal and when you're doing monetary policy. But that's, that's been lost in the current environment, the big overlap. World Bank President David Malpass at a forum in Washington, D.C., hosted by the group Committee to Unleash Prosperity. Wall Street today, the Dow up 748, NASDAQ up 244, S&P up 86. Washington Today continues in a moment. C-SPAN Now is a free mobile app featuring your unfiltered view of what's happening in Washington, live and on demand. Keep up with the day's biggest events with live streams of floor proceedings and hearings from the U.S. Congress, White House events, the courts, campaigns, and more from the world of politics, all at your fingertips. You can also stay current with the latest episodes of Washington Journal and find scheduling information for C-SPAN's TV networks and C-SPAN Radio, plus a variety of compelling podcasts. C-SPAN Now is available at the Apple Store and Google Play. Download it for free today. C-SPAN Now, your front row seat to Washington, anytime, anywhere.
Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the free C-SPAN Now mobile video app and wherever you get your podcasts. The Pentagon says that Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin spoke with Russian Minister of Defense Sergei Shogu today by phone. It's the second known call between the two in eight months since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The Pentagon says that Secretary Austin emphasized the importance of maintaining lines of communication amid the ongoing war against Ukraine. The Secretary of State Antony Blinken answering questions about the war and contact between the U.S. and Russia today at a joint press conference at the State Department in Washington with the French Foreign Affairs Minister. This week, the Russian ambassador here in Washington spoke about a quiet channel of diplomacy that was used around the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis to avoid a nuclear conflict. Then Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy and the Russian ambassador here were leading that channel. Has the Biden administration studied that model and considered how to replicate something similar to that going forward to try and trigger a diplomatic path out of this war? Thank you. We uh, have been very clear that whenever we have something that it's important to communicate to the Russians, we'll do it, and we've done it. Um, I've had occasion to speak to Foreign Minister Lavrov on specific issues that were important to our own, uh, our own security. Um, other colleagues, including the Secretary of Defense, the National Security Advisor, have communicated with their counterparts, and will continue to do that. Um, when it comes to diplomacy to end the war, it depends entirely on whether Russia gets to a place where it's actually interested in stopping the aggression that it started. And we have seen no evidence of that um, in, in, this, in this moment. On the contrary, we see Russia doubling and tripling down on its aggression. In the last month, the mobilization of um, hundreds of thousands of Russians uh, horrifically cannon fodder that Putin is trying to throw into the war. <laughs> for the, th for the 300,000 Russians that have reportedly been mobilized, um, more than that number have fled the country to avoid having to go to, uh, to Ukraine. Uh, second, of course, this effort to um, have the sham referenda and then uh, annex Ukrainian territory, which was rejected by virtually the entire world, 143 countries. Uh, now, a horrific bombing campaign against critical civilian infrastructure, against, as Catherine said, the uh, facilities across the country that are trying to generate electricity and power uh, for the country to keep, uh, to keep the lights on, to keep people warm during the winter, um, brutalizing the Ukrainian people. Uh, so every indication is that far from being willing to engage in meaningful diplomacy, uh, President Putin continues to push in the opposite direction. The fundamental problem he has is that not only are the Ukrainian people extraordinarily courageous and resilient, um, they're also very successful in not only repelling the aggression, but taking their land back. And uh, it all, all comes down to what I've been saying for some time, which is that with the assistance that we've been providing, with the incredible courage of the Ukrainian people, the fundamental difference maker is that Ukrainians are fighting for their country, for their land, for their future. Russia is not. The sooner President Putin understands that and comes to that conclusion, the sooner we'll be able to end this war. Secretary of State Antony Blinken at the State Department, a joint news conference with the visiting French foreign minister. Bipartisan delegation from the U.S. House Intelligence Committee met in Kyiv today with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. It's the first visit by a congressional delegation to the city in more than a month. Turning to Haiti, this from Reuters, the United Nations Security Council has approved a sanctions regime to punish criminal gangs in Haiti and called for an arms embargo on non-state actors as security, economic and health crises deepen in the Caribbean country. The U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, told the Security Council that Washington intends to bring forward another resolution to send non-UN foreign armed forces to Haiti to help maintain security and enable the flow of desperately needed humanitarian aid. This resolution is an initial answer to the calls for help from the Haitian people. 
They want us to take action against criminal actors, including gangs and their financiers, who have been undermining stability and expanding poverty in their vibrant society. In response, this council sanctioned one of the country's most notorious gang leaders, a gang leader whose actions have directly contributed to the humanitarian crisis that has caused so much pain and suffering to the people of Haiti. We're sending a clear message to the bad actors that are holding Haiti hostage. The international community will not stand idly by while you wreak havoc on the Haitian people. Sanctions are at their most effective when they are targeted specifically towards bad actors and allow humanitarian aid to reach civilian populations. The resolution we adopted today accomplishes both these objectives. We have also worked to incorporate clear, measurable, and well-defined methods to periodically review the efficacy of these sanctions. And I thank my colleagues for their strong voices on this matter. U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Linda Thomas-Greenfield at the U.N. Security Council in New York City today. That audio from the United Nations website. More from the Reuters story. Haiti is the poorest country in the Americas and is facing an acute political, economic, security, and health crisis with a growing cholera epidemic sparking a breakdown of law and order. Haiti's criminal gangs have protested for weeks, calling for Prime Minister Ariel Henry to grant amnesty to gang members after they blocked Haiti's port, slowing fuel shipments. Now to Great Britain, speculation growing that former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who resigned a few months ago over ethics scandals, may again run for leader following Prime Minister Liz Truss's resignation yesterday. The governing Conservative Party in Britain wants to have elections for the new Prime Minister finished by the end of next week. Associated Press reports Boris Johnson has not even declared he is running, but bookmakers have made him one of the favorites to win the contest, reflecting the scale, division, and disarray in the party as it picks its third prime minister of the year. Here are a couple of views of two conservative members of parliament. Defense Minister Ben Wallace supports Boris Johnson. At the moment, I would lean towards Boris Johnson. I think he will still have some questions to answer around, obviously, that investigation. But I know when I was Secretary of State for Defence, he invested in defence, he supported me, he supported uh, the actions this country has taken to keep us safe. Uh, so that's at the moment I'm leaning towards that. In 2019, he won a general election with a huge majority. You know, he was legitimately sent into Parliament as the Prime Minister based on the vote of the whole electorate, not just on Tory members, not just on members of Parliament, that he got a mandate. And I think that's an important thing for all of us to bear in mind. You know, I'll be keen to see what Rishi Zina also says on defence and security and investment. And I think it's just important to reiterate to your viewers, there can't be economic security without national security. Uh, and therefore, you know, those candidates need to answer that question as much as what they're going to do in the here and now about the economy. Ben Wallace, conservative member of parliament in Great Britain, interviewed by The Guardian newspaper. Another conservative MP, Crispin Blunt, thinks his party should pick somebody else. He was on Sky News. So you say he's probably not the person to come in and, and pull the party together. But Boris Johnson would argue he's the only one with a real mandate. He won that landslide in, in 2019, mm. that, that big majority. He would say he's got a track record of winning elections. Would you be disappointed if he replaced Liz Truss? I, I would foresee that we're going to be probably straight back in the pickle we were in uh, when he left office. And I don't therefore think that's the right route to take. Uh, I want to es escape from that, those uh, those problems, and I want to present my party and my government to the country in the best possible way in 2024. And I say that uh, disinterestedly because I will not be standing in 2024. And I think it's these two years are really needed to uh, deliver a really good administration, lay the foundation for getting out of the COVID crisis, uh, for uh, leading... Uh, Western Europe and uh, contributing to the rest of the world standing shoulder to shoulder uh, with Ukraine with the very serious security threat uh, that the Russians now pose to order, uh, at least in Europe, and of course the continuing rise in China. These are the issues that have got, that have got to be addressed. And Rishi Sunak is as well placed uh, to deal with those uh, as uh, Boris Johnson. He's uh, spent enough time on the international circuit uh, for people to have got to know him. 
and he will carry uh, proper authority. And that is necessary over the next two years. Crispin Blunt, member of parliament on Sky News. Former Prime Minister Boris Johnson's father says his son is on a plane and flying home from his Caribbean vacation. And the hashtag Boris or bust is starting to circulate. Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor on Thursday, writes CNN, said having four women on the Supreme Court, first time the high court has had so many female justices, has had an impact on the quality of the conversation. The increased share of women on the bench makes the conversation less adversarial and more collegial, she added. Justice Sotomayor was at Roosevelt University in Chicago. Ketanji Brown Jackson was confirmed in April, joining Sonia Sotomayor, Elena Kagan, and Amy Coney Barrett on the court. Today, Justice Kagan spoke at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia about women on the high court. You know, sometimes people say, oh, if uh, there are women there, you, you, you know, they'll, they'll think differently about the law than men will. And I have to say, I think that that's not usually true. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, ve- on, in, an, in an occasional exceptional case, but uh, usually women, you know, the women on this, and I think this, you know, it's become, um, um, you know, with Justice Barrett coming to the court, I mean, Justice Barrett and I, we agree about some things and we disagree about some things. And, and being a woman just just doesn't have all that much to do with it. Um, but, um, but, I, but I think that the thing, it's, 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 I, I used to think like uh, you, you would look out in the courtroom, this is in the pre-COVID days when we had an audience, and see all these school groups. And, and, to, and for them, for all these girls and boys both, um, to see uh, women's faces and women's voices coming from all different directions, um, you know, was, is, was an f- unbelievable thing. And, um, and now we have four. You know, your old justice, Justice Ginsburg, I think she was once asked, like, how many women is enough? And she said, how about nine? nine, nine, nine. Um, <laughs> but, you know, uh, but, but, but before seems actually like uh, even more than three in just the, in the sense of um, just th- there's a lot of women talking. Uh, and, you know, I, I was just, uh, I, I just saw a bar graph that one of these, uh, I think, I don't know which newspaper published, but it was um, about uh, uh, all the justices on the Supreme Court, and they said, how many words had you spoken in your first eight arguments? All right, that was the mm-hmm. question. Mm-hmm. And it turned out that the number one, two, three, and four most talkative justices in their first four arguments were the four women. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, like, none of us are shrinking violets. Um, and, uh, and you go to the Supreme Court these days and, you know, women look like they're, they're in there. <laughs> Supreme Court Justice Elena Kagan at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. CNN held a memorial for the network's original lead anchor, Bernard Shaw, Thursday night at the National Press Club in Washington. Bernard Shaw died last month at the age of 82. C-SPAN was there, one of the tributes coming from current CNN reporter and anchor, and friend of Bernard Shaw, Wolf Blitzer. I suspect many of you have your own Bernie stories, a moment of kindness, a moment when you felt fortunate to be working with and learning from such a truly extraordinary man and journalist. Some of you may have actually been inspired to walk the trail he blazed as one of the first African-American network news anchors. That was such a significant step forward at the time for which Bernie and Ted Turner deserve so much credit. The beauty of it was when viewers watched Bernie, they saw first and foremost a journalist they could trust in the mold of Bernie's mentor and friend, Walter Cronkite. Those of us who work closely with Bernie and are still at CNN today do our best to keep his legacy alive. Like Bernie, I have over the years tried to look out for newcomers to the network, especially print journalists who may not know a lot about TV. And you're welcome, John King. I, because of Bernie, I always go out of my way whenever there's a newcomer to CNN to reach out and to give some advice, to work with them. And I do it in memory, now in memory of Bernie, but I, I always did it because that's what Bernie did to me. I got to tell you, there were other uh, TV journalists at CNN who didn't necessarily do all that for me. 
But Bernie did, and I will always, of course, be grateful. Many of us strive to live up to another piece of advice Bernie gave me. He always told me, he said, remember, Wolf, we're not performers on television, we are journalists. We all know that cable news has changed quite a bit since Bernie was at CNN. There are new pressures, greater competition, unprecedented challenges in reporting the news, and especially politics. But Bernie was and still is a beacon we can all follow, a shining example of excellence. And as I often remind people, Ted Turner's mantra, when he hired me, he, he, I remember vividly, he said, remember, Wolf, he said, the news comes first. He said, we are the cable news network, capital N, capital E, capital W, capital S. No one embo- embodied that more than Bernie Shaw. CNN anchor Wolf Blitzer at the tribute to the late retired CNN anchor Bernard Shaw Thursday night at the National Press Club. C-SPAN has the full program, and it will air Saturday night at 8 p.m. Eastern on C-SPAN television. You'll also be able to find it at our video library, cspan.org. And thanks for listening to Washington Today. Subscribe to C-SPAN's evening newsletter, Word for Word, to get the stories Washington is talking about sent to your inbox every day. You can sign up at c-span.org forward slash connect. Have a good night and weekend. <music>